and there we go. It might it might um pop up a little thing that you might have to press OK. Did it Do pop I up? To say got it. Yep, just say got it, and that's it. Okay. And then I'm gonna go ahead and let everybody in. And then um, I'll introduce uh, the program and I'll introduce you. And then I will let you know whenever I pass over the reins to you. Okay. And Brooke, I'm a very fast talker. So if you need me to slow down, if it looks like I'm not using enough time, just give me a hint. Okay. Can do. Can okay. Do. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. I'm going to let... Um, folks in as they are joining us, but my name is Brooke. I am a program coordinator with Alzheimer's Services and welcome to our second, uh, second presentation of our Making Sense of Sense presentation uh, on for fall 2023. Hope you all join us again next week. We have um, a certified financial planner, Adam Kerrigan, with us next Tuesday for our final Making Sense of Sense presentation. And then um, tomorrow we have an ADAPT presentation on adaptive diet and delaying dementia through diet. So if y'all haven't joined us in those, you can register on our website um, to, to join us for those. So, um, again, like I said, for those of uh, y'all just joining us, my name is Brooke. I work for Alzheimer's services. And, um, this is one of our, um, most popular presentations, which is making sense and sense and just how, um, different financial aspects can, um, impact caregiving or how different, uh, financial uh, institutions we need for caregiving. And so today we are going to be talking about social security and social security disabilities, which is something that I get questions on every now and then. So I'm so glad we have an expert to talk to us about those. Um, so I'm going to introduce Miss Barbara Mixon. That is our presenter for today. She um, was initially referred to me by one of my elder law attorneys that I rely heavily on. And she told me that um, Barbara Mixon is her go-to um, social security attorney. So that we've, we've got the, the creme de la creme today to help uh, teach us on this. And so I'm gonna introduce Ms. Barbara Mixon um, with a little bio of hers. She was born and raised in Cotton Fort, Louisiana. She is the oldest of 46 grandchildren and she grew up surrounded by family. She is a graduate of LSU and the LSU School of Law. She was one of the first female attorneys in Avoyles Parish. She and her husband, Mark, who is a fourth generation sugarcane farmer, are parents to three and grandparents to six. She is an avid reader and enjoys LSU football, playing pickleball, and considers herself a political junkie. In 1981, Miss Barbara began working as an attorney for what was then called the Office of Hearings and Appeals, which was the adjunctive branch of the Social Security Administration. There, she was responsible for supervising a staff of 16 attorneys and paralegals. She was there for 21 years and then left to uh, work in private practice and she has been with her current firm, which is NBA, for over 10 years now and assists with a growing and multi-state social security disability practice. During her time there, she feels very fortunate to have helped many families with their quest for disability benefits. She has a great empathy for her clients that and has spent um, her career helping people navigate this often difficult process. She is a member of the Louisiana Bar Association, as well as the Avoyles and Rapides Parish Bar Associations. And so I am so glad for um, Ms. Barbara Mixon to be teaching us on Social Security Disability today. And um, welcome everybody for joining us um, for this presentation. I'll pass it on over to you, Ms. Barbara. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. And I may take out the LSU band after Saturday night. I'm still trying to get over that. So as Brooke explained, I'm an attorney. I've been practicing for 43 years, primarily, well, entirely focused on social security disability law. What I wanted to talk to you about um, 
or how do you qualify for social security benefits? Most people think you only get social security when you're old enough to retire, either age 62 or when you reach full retirement age. That's not the case. Social security has built within there a disability insurance benefit program. That is an individual who has paid sufficient quarters in to social security can qualify for what in essence is early retirement benefits based on the fact that they meet the statutory definition of disability. That is a condition that is so severe that it will either result in death or prevent you from engaging in any substantial gainful activity considering your age, education, and past work experience. Um, there's also a program called Supplemental Security Income. This is the same test of disability. It is in fact the old welfare program, which was just grandfathered in to the social security disability program. The difference in SSI, SSI is income and needs based. And if any of you work with people who are uh, have limited income and resources, you may be familiar with this term. Again, it's the same test of disability. However, you have to meet the income and needs criteria. You can not have resources other than your home, your car, uh, over $2,000. And you may find that as well. It, before Louisiana accepted the Medicaid expansion program, this was also qualifying criteria to see if you qualify for Medicaid. If you qualify for $1 of SSI, you qualify for Medicaid which is extremely important in those states which have not accepted Medicare expansion, Medicaid expansion, and makes getting medical care crucial to individuals who need it. With Social Security Disability, SSDI, in time you qualify for Medicare. So remember, Medicaid goes with SSI, Medicare goes with disability insurance benefits. And we will discuss the differences in those programs later on in this presentation. Um, people will call me, and I'm sure, Brooke, if you have questions, how do I apply for these benefits? The easiest way is to contact your local Social Security office and schedule an appointment to file. Social Security representative will then call you and take all the information needed to start this claim. If you consider yourself computer savvy, you can go online and file. You cannot file online for SSI. You can only file online for disability insurance benefits. How long does it Oh, I'm sorry. How long does it typically take before benefits award are awarded? This is where I disappoint everybody who's listening to me. Honestly, a year and a half. So the key to getting these benefits is perseverance and appealing any denial you get. It's a two-step denial process. The first is an initial denial. The second is a reconsideration denial. Then you file a request for review with an administrative law judge. I don't know how complicated or how detailed you want me to get into this, but the first two steps are made by state, Louisiana State Department of Children uh, and Department of Health and Human Services. Typically, 80 to 85% of all cases are denied initially and on recon. So if you have a family member or friend yourself who receives a denial, do not give up. Don't think my case isn't valid. I was denied appeal and appeal. When you get to the hearing level, we have at the hearing level probably an 85% success rate. So that is the key to getting these benefits is to persevere. If you're found disabled and eligible to disability insurance benefits, is there a waiting period before you can receive monetary benefits? And that is correct. If you are found disabled, there's a five month waiting period before your disability begins. And this is with disability insurance benefits. Keep these programs separate. With disability insurance benefits, there is a 29 month waiting period before you're eligible for Medicare. So you file for disability insurance, they find you disabled as of January, 2023. It will be June, 2025 before you qualify for Medicare. The only exceptions to this 
29 month waiting period or if you're on dialysis or if you suffer from Lou Gehrig's disease. So it's a tremendous hardship for someone who not only needs financial assistance, but who more importantly needs Medicare coverage. With SSI, and remember those are the benefits that are income and resource based, and with that comes Medicaid. There is no waiting period for Medicaid entitlement. Benefits and Medicaid eligibility is based on the date of your application or your disability onset date of later. People will ask me, well, I'm 62. Should I go ahead and apply for disability benefits, apply for early retirement, or just wait till I'm old enough to reach full retirement age? Apply for disability benefits. First of all, it kind of preserves your benefit rate at a higher rate. In some cases, it will result in a slightly earlier entitlement to Medicare. You don't have to do anything else. You apply for disability. When you're 62, you can go ahead and apply for early retirement. And if you're found dis disabled when you reach full retirement age, those benefits simply convert to retirement. The only provision is, or the only proviso is, you cannot receive both retirement benefits and disability benefits on your same earnings record. You're going to receive the higher of the two. Uh, can you work while you're receiving Social Security disability benefits? Yes, you can. The important thing is to know the limits, the financial limits as to how much you can make. And secondly, to be aware of your reporting responsibility to Social Security. Otherwise, you're going to be assessed with a tremendous overpayment that they will withhold from your disability or ultimately your retirement benefits. And nobody wants to face that. Uh, Social Security benefits, are, when do you, are they payable? Your application for disability insurance benefits has a one-year retroactive effect. So if you apply in January 2023, they find you disabled as of January 2022. Your onset date and the date they will use to calculate past due benefits owed to you will be January 2022. Again, remember, SSI benefits, which is an entirely different animal, those benefits are paid based on the date of your application. How much will you receive? If it's disability insurance benefits, that depends on your earnings over your lifetime, the age in which you begin receiving retirement benefits, and whether you're eligible to receive a spouse's benefit instead of your own. As you know, the earliest you can apply for retirement benefits is age 62. And of course, you take a reduction in the amount of your retirement benefits as opposed to waiting until you reach full retirement age or if you're fortunate enough until you're age 70. You may be eligible to benefits, let's say as a widow or widower. In calculating the benefits paid to you, Social Security will pay you the higher benefit amount. So while your benefit amount paid on your own earnings record may be $900 a month, if drawing benefits on your spouse's record is $1,200, you will be paid the $1,200, not both, the higher of the two benefit rates. Medicare versus Medicaid. And I don't know how much you want me to get into this, but if I were dealing with someone who suffered from, from a uh, progressive illness, I would want to be concerned about this as to what kind of insurance coverage will you receive. As you know, Medicare is a federal health insurance program available to anyone 65 and older. Now, that's anyone who's paid into Social Security, and, and you can have all kind of variations on this. Some of you may have taught school or worked in federal employment employment or work for a city or state. In those instances, you're paying into a state or federal or school-based retirement, but you are paying into Medicare. Even though you're not paying into Social Security, you're paying into Medicare. You're considered a Medicare qualified government employee. When you reach age 65 or older, you automatically qualify for Medicare. If you're under 65 and you're found disabled 
and you serve that 29 month waiting period, you're eligible for Medicare. Again, Medicaid is a joint federal and state program that is effective uh, immediately when you apply. Now, thankfully, Louisiana has accepted the Medicare expansion program, which raised the income limits and allowed hundreds of thousands of people to not qualify for Medicaid. It's not nearly as stringent as it used to be, and, and, and that's a benefit to us all. Uh, People will ask me, and I'm sure if you, you're here because of a parent or friend or uh, I have, they will call me, I have my mother's power of attorney. Can I apply for her? No. The Treasury Department, no, nor the Social Security rep, uh, recognize a power of attorney. If you want to manage your mother's benefits, your child's benefits, you have to ask to be named as that individual's representative payee. That is an adjudication made by the local social security office to determine one, if the recipient has the mental capacity or fiscal capacity to handle their, or their own funds, and if not, who would be best served by handling those funds for him. The fact that you have, you're the power of attorney, your name's on that checking account, none of that matters you have to be named that person's representative payee, and that is a determination made by your local social security office. If you take on that duty, know with that comes responsibility. You're owed an accounting to social security as to how you disperse those funds. And more importantly, if any overpayment occurs on that individual's account, you may not even know about it. The individual may not know about it, as a representative payee, you are responsible for repaying that overpayment. Oh, I can't. Okay, how do I get out of here? Stop share. All righty. Um, I, I, that was quite a, a short presentation. What I wanted to talk about as well, and I don't have a screen, a slide of this, was the differences between Medicare and Medicaid. Does anyone have any questions about that? Or would you just like me to discuss the primary differences in those types of state and or federally funded insurance programs? I think maybe just go and and uh, give your, you know, your best uh, definition of it, just as okay. basic as possible. Okay, Medicaid, again, Medicaid is for people of limited income and resources. Medicaid has advantages over Medicare, and that you don't serve a waiting period, and it covers all prescriptions or with a minimal copay, which Medicare does not absent a supplemental policy. The problem with Medicaid, and if any of you uh, are on Medicaid or no one know someone who is on Medicaid, while it does pay for doctor services, the problem is finding a doctor who'll take it. Certainly finding you may get some rural health clinics or some primary care physician, but to find a uh, specialist who takes Medicaid is almost impossible. So while it does provide, it does cover hospital stays um, and it does cover prescriptions, getting sometimes getting the medical care you need with a Medicaid card only, it is very, very difficult and much more difficult than I think anyone envisioned. Medicare, on the other hand, absent buying a Part D policy does not in itself cover for prescription services. However, the good thing is, well, some doctors are not even taking Medicare anymore, but Medicare offers a greater array of treating sources than you would have with Medicaid only. Medicare comes into effect when you reach the age 65 or if you are found disabled prior to age 65. Um, Medicare is open to all income limits, while Medicaid is open to any of those who are near or below the poverty line and provides them with free or low cash, low cost coverage. Okay. Can you be covered by both Medicare and Medicaid? Yes, in certain circumstances you can. Indeed, if you qualify, if your income is such. Uh, Medicaid may pay your Medicare premium. 
So that's something you may want to look into if you have dual qualification for these uh, health services to have Medicaid pay your Medicare premium, your Medicare Part B premium, which is a tremendous benefit. And you know, they can be $150, $200 a month that you're saving in out-of-pocket expenses. So that is something I would investigate. Uh, let's see. We talked about the differences between Medicare and Medicaid. People will ask me what's covered by Medicaid and what's covered by Medicare. While Medicaid and Medicare both cover hospitalizations, doctors, and medical care. Medicaid's coverage is more comprehensive in that it includes prescription drugs, long-term care, and other add-ons determined by the state. Now, anyone, I mean, my mother died last year, and the problem we had, we managed to keep her at her home until six months, six weeks before she died, was qualifying her for Medicaid. We never did any estate planning. It was our fault. We had to put her in the nursing home. And as you know, Medicare doesn't cover nursing home cost. That's why you, you want to get yourself Medicaid eligible because Medicaid does. And what happens is your funds will be depleted. Now, they allow you to keep $150,000 to avoid impoverishing you, but they will take it everything you have until you're Medicaid eligible. I don't do estate planning. I know people who do. You know, there's a five-year look back period as to what, if anything, you do. But if you're caring for someone who you think will eventually need uh, long-term health care, that is something you would want to look into. And I know it was a tremendous problem for us. And I imagine it is for anyone dealing with an elderly relative. Um, Some people will ask me, well, I want to apply for Social Security. What do I need to bring? What should I bring with me to the office? Or when they call, what should I have with me? The only thing they're ever going to ask you to prove uh, is a birth certificate, a proof of United States citizenship if you were born in another country, uh, any W-2 forms you may have, any medical records you may have. But it's not a complicated thing to do. People are, you know, somewhat taken aback. They're going to call you and ask you basic questions, your age, your education, your spouse. Uh, and then later on, we'll send you more detailed forms wanting to know your work history, what do you do during the day, and who provides you with medical treatment. But applying for Social Security benefits, be it retirement, widows, widowers, disability. It's, it, the application process itself is not difficult and don't be put off by doing it. Think you can't do it, do it or think um, it, it's beyond your capability. It's not. That's the one thing a person has to do. They have to apply on their own. You can help them. You can sign this. I'm filling this application for someone else. But you can't just go in and say, oh, I'm going to apply for disability benefits for my grandmother. That doesn't work like that. You have to have their consent and their permission to do this. But people will ask, uh, how do you get paid? There's no more, everyone knows this, there's no more mailing of checks. Payments are made either to a checking account, and if you can't establish any mechanism for direct pay, they will give you what I refer to as a debit card that they will simply load every month with the benefits you're eligible to. As to who draws benefits on your record, those are called auxiliary benefits. If you get SSI, no one draws benefits on your record. The only one who can get that check is you. And once you die, those benefits cease. If you draw disability insurance benefits, and remember, compare those to retirement benefits. I paid into Social Security all my life. I'm either old enough to retire, or I'm too ill physically or emotionally to continue working. If you've paid enough into Social Security, any children you have under the age of 18 who live with you will be entitled to an auxiliary benefit on your record. And that's in addition to what you draw. Let's say you're drawing a disability benefit of $2,000. Well, your family amount, whatever eligible children you have, in total, we'll draw another $1,000. So 
So that's that's a tremendous help to people who have minor children in their home. If you have what's called a disabled adult child, that's a child between 18 and, 18 and 22 who is established to be disabled. These children as well can draw a benefit on my account, on, on their parents' account, if the parent has paid enough into Social Security. And again, with SSI, the only people who draw benefits are the actual applicant themselves. And I'm sorry I talked too fast and maybe didn't have enough material, but do y'all have any questions to ask of me? I'll give it a second for, for folks to ask some questions. I do have a few questions. Um, when is a social security attorney needed? I know we refer a lot to elder law attorneys for estate planning, for power of attorney, for if someone has an interdiction or something like that, that they need, but when are you called in? When is a family in need of, of, of a more specialized attorney? Well, I'm going to be perfectly frank with you. By regulation, you do not need an attorney to, to handle these proceedings. You can be represented by a non-attorney. You can be represented by your brother. It's up to you. Now, when are we called in? We're called in at any step in this process. Even before someone files, they will call us and we'll direct them on the application process, send the appropriate forms. I can tell you, you don't need an attorney legally. I will tell you practically with the denial rate in Louisiana and the length of time it takes to complete this adjudicative process, you don't have to hire me. You don't have to hire anybody I know get some help. This is a long, drawn-out process. It's terribly frustrating. It's Your fees are paid. The attorney fees or the rep fees are paid from your past due benefits. So if your case is unsuccessful, there's no money owed. If a, uh, an attorney fee is owed, it's paid by Social Security from your past due benefits. If I were doing it, I would get someone to represent me. It, it's just... You know, you're looking at years, honestly, of, of getting through this process and sending in records and answering forms and appearing at a hearing and appealing to different denial determination. And it can be overwhelming. And most people simply give up, which is absolutely the worst thing you can do in these proceedings is to give up and say, I'm not fooling with this. It's not worth it. Okay. And can you talk a little bit more? I know you said that Social Security does not um, recognize a power of attorney. Um, so can you talk a little bit more about that process of, I think you said that you have to um, sign a, another form or something that says that another yes. person what happens is, is, okay, I'm, I'm filing for my retirement benefits and I'm whatever, 67, I wish. But in any event, I'm filing for my retirement benefits and I have a mental or physical disability. And of course, it's usually mental or a cognitive problem that prevent me from handling my funds in an effective manner. Well, Social Security, your local office, Social Security is made up of local district offices. There are two in Baton Rouge, one on Bankers, one on Harding. Uh, so each there are probably 25 in the state. They handle all the practical aspects, issuing social security cards, taking applications, uh, effectuating payment. They will see something in your record or, or you will go and say, look, my mother was awarded benefits. She simply cannot handle these. Can I be her representative payee? The check will come to you. You will manage, you will pay her bills. But again, you're owed an accounting as to how you spend her money. And if for some reason, there's any overpayment on your mother's record, you are responsible for repaying that overpayment as a representative payee. It, it's, it's a burdensome thing to ask someone to do. And there are agencies who for a small fee will serve as rep payees. Another great example is you have a 68 year old who's a drug addict and you know if they get their hands on their money, it's gonna be gone in two days. Well, you want someone to intervene and say, no, let someone pay that rent, dole them out money, pay their necessary living expenses, rather than letting this person just do whatever they want with their, their funds. Um, and I, we have a couple of questions coming in, but I've had before 
um, a family who I think it was their father was receiving his social security disabilities, a disability check and, or his social security check. And, um, through his dementia was being scammed for that money was spending it unwisely because he no longer had the, um, rational decision-making to spend that money. So what would you tell a family that was in that circumstance? I would tell them to go into their local office and appoint someone to handle his funds. Okay, so it's as simple as, as going and appointing them. Now, you may have to bring medical documentation, a statement from that treating source, you know, listing the diagnosis and why the, the doctor feels this person is not capable, examples of how they spent their money or were taken advantage of. But yes, ask to be named that person's representative payee. Okay. And I have a, a few questions, and please, everybody, we have a good bit of time, um, so please give us your questions so that, you know, while we have Miss Barbara here, she can help answer those. Um, Miss Barbara, if I'm reading any of these questions and you think that they're not appropriate for this um, venue, then feel free to tell me and, and you can answer them privately to whoever is um, asking these questions. Sure. Um, okay, so I have a question. Um, and it says, my brother-in-law is going to be 62 in January. I feel like I'm reading out a word problem to you for like an ACT. Okay. And he is going in a train for 75 months. <laughs> uh, okay. So my brother-in-law is going to be 62 in January. He has been married, but separated from his husband for many years, but has never legally divorced. Does this affect his SSI or SSDI benefits? If so, how? Okay, so let's distinguish what your brother-in-law is filing for. Because he's going to be 62, is he contemplating filing for early retirement benefits? Okay, so that would be your first question to that family. Right. Do if, they, if they answer yes, he's going to... His marital status means nothing. Okay. Now, and if, he, if, if the answer is no. If they're applying for SSI... All they look at, all Social Security looks at, is household income. If the spouse, they're not divorced, but they're not living together, and you can prove they're not living together, and it's not a scam, then the wayward spouse's income does not count okay. for SSI. And for any kind of disability or retirement benefits, you know, I went to a presentation once that said, Steve Jobs can get Social Security disability and get Medicare. Income does not matter, okay? You're going to be worth $20 million. They're going to pay you your retirement or your disability benefits. Okay. Um, another question, is dementia or diagnosed Alzheimer's considered a disability? Uh, disability is not diagnosis driven, other than a few exceptions, like you're on dialysis or Lou Gehrig's disease. What Social Security looks at, they recognize the diagnosis as a medically determinable impairment. What they look at are the functional limitations that result that from, they're from, and do those functional limitations preclude the individual from engaging in substantial gainful work? Okay. Um, somebody asked, um, can you explain a little bit more about filing for homebound care benefits when receiving Social Security and Medicaid benefits? I wish I could. I can't. So homebound care benefits, is that those are Medicaid, like um, home and community-based services? Um, is that what? Is that paid to the provider? I believe so. In that, um, we whoever is asking this question, we have a, a, a past presentation done by um, Linda Malasa, who is an elder law attorney and kind of broke down Medicaid benefits um, that I'm happy to share that with you. It's on our YouTube channel, or I'm happy to um, refer you to a, a specialist with that. Okay. Here's another question for you, Miss Barbara. I no longer work and I'm taking care of my grandchildren and I don't have income. Do I apply for SSI or am I good since I have worked in the past? All right. Have you worked to qualify for disability insurance benefits? So I assume you're under retirement age. 
Is that a valid assumption to make? I'm not sure. Okay, so if you're gonna, you're under full retirement age, you're under 67 and you wanna apply for disability, you have to have worked and paid in 40 quarters. So you have to have paid in social security for 10 years. Doesn't have to be 10 consecutive years, but you have to have 40 quarters of coverage. 20 of those have to have been earned within the past 10 years. So if you satisfy those two criteria, you can go in and apply for disability. To draw retirement benefits, the only uh, eligibility requirement is that you have paid in 40 quarters. Okay. So you've worked and paid into Social Security. If she hasn't worked in a while and she's taking care of her grandchildren, that may affect her ability to draw disability benefits, but it won't affect her ability to draw retirement. Okay. And this um, may be a silly question. So let's say um, I am 70 years old and I have been married to my spouse for 50 years. I never worked, but my spouse did, but he has since passed away. Do okay. I, do I, am I eligible for their social security benefits? Absolutely. Once you're 60 and you're, you're the widow or widower and your spouse paid in enough money, at age 60, you qualify for what's called widow or widower's benefits, which is typically 75% of what your spouse would have drawn. Now, if you're 50 and you're a widow or widower and you're disabled, you qualify for disabled widow or widower's benefits. So even though you haven't worked, but you have an earnings record to file on, which is the earnings record of your deceased spouse. So yes, you can. Okay. Um, let's see. And do remember, having said that, that even if you're divorced, if you've been married, if you were married to that individual for at least 10 years, you didn't remarry before age 60, and even if he has six ex-wives floating around there, you're still entitled to draw on his record. And they don't divide that amount between the all the eligible spouses, ex-spouses. Each spouse gets the full benefit amount. So don't think because you divorced him, you know, when you were 40 and you're now 65 and you're wondering what to do. If you were married to him for 10 years and you didn't remarry before 60, look into filing on his record. So you mentioned briefly um, something about if you're 62, go ahead and start applying. Can you talk a little bit more about that? I, I'm not. Don't go ahead and start applying if you're not disabled. Okay. If you're thinking of filing for disability benefits and you're 62, apply for both so you'll have some kind of income coming in. If you're not disabled and you want to continue working, because as you know, if you draw age 62 retirement benefits and you work, if you earn over, I think it's $22,000 a year now, they're going to reduce your retirement benefits. So if you're still working and you're not full retirement age, talk to your accountant, talk to someone because there is that benefit offset you don't want to risk. Okay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so I've had before a family who, oh, okay, here we go. I got another question. And, and then if not, I'll keep thinking of some that I've um, Thank you. had, had um, asked me in the past. And everybody who is on here, I know that we have some folks on here um, who work for the state and different um, like elderly affair offices and things like that, please ask some frequently asked questions that may um, spark a question that some of our other participants um, maybe want to know and just haven't thought to ask. Um, okay, here uh, somebody asked, um, are there any resources to help financially support folks um, in the year after waiting for the SSDI benefits to start? I wish I could tell you that there were. Um, no, I mean, other than the ones we always refer people to, food stamps, uh, Medicaid, and I'm sure you have a greater knowledge of what social services are out there. And if you would have a chance, I'd love if you would share those with me because I get that question all the time too. Well, you were in luck. Just last week I did, that was our Making Sense of Sense presentation was different programs available to support people. So I will happily well, let share them know how to find that. And I would love to share it in my office because, you know, we get people calling and these people, as you see, they're desperate. 
and you feel so sorry for them and are tired of saying the same thing over and over. Oh, I'm sorry, there's nothing I can do to help you. I don't know how some of these people truly make it from month to month. I couldn't do it. I don't know how they survive in, in, in this environment. I really don't. Yeah. And what's also, I mean, one of the reasons why I and I like that we do these presentations is there's so much misinformation out there or so much of this process is so convoluted that people don't even try to access these benefits. So it's nice to have professionals that are available to kind of help us walk through this process because a lot of that stuff that you were saying at the very beginning, whoop, right over my head, I would have to hear it five to seven times for it to actually stick in my brain. And how um, many times do you get my neighbor told me? They love to tell me my neighbor told me. Yeah, I heard on one on an yeah. article one day. Um, yeah, it is not a good resource. Yeah. Is there anything that you can do that can speed up the process of benefits coming in? I can offer my firstborn child. Uh, honestly, we try everything. We, 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 and it's, you said there are people here from the state. Is there anyone who works with disability determination services before <laughs> I bash them? Well, maybe let's be politically correct in all things. Just so okay, that let's be politically correct. The current environment is after COVID, when people started working from home and the whole process got upended, it is terrible the delays. Now, there are reasons we can ask that the case be expedited. The individual is actively suicidal. If they suffer from a condition that's terminal, if they are, uh, by they have no form of permanent housing. In those cases, we can ask, and we do ask, and we do push that they consider that case of, out of order. But I am telling you, I am telling people now, you're going to wait nine months for an initial decision. They are thousands of cases behind. Mm. Mm. And it's awful. Yeah. And you said terminal. I mean, the Alzheimer's definitely is a terminal diagnosis. That is not considered a terminal. They do not consider that terminal? Terminal illness is stage four lung cancer with metastasis to the liver. Okay. That is terminal. Okay. Um, okay. So another question that I have is um, I have had before where it was a um, early onset diagnosis. So someone in their 40s or 50s that has been diagnosed with some type of dementia. And it is now, um, you know, their parents that are helping care for them. So if that person has only worked maybe 15 to 20 years um, prior to their diagnosis, how would you how would you talk with that family about how that to person? Them? Okay, that person has worked 15 years. They've worked their 40 quarters. They paid in 60 quarters. So they're insured. That's what you call it. Are you insured for purposes of dis of benefits? Have you paid in enough into Social Security? If they have, which it sounds like this 40-year-old person has, I would tell them to apply for disability benefits for that person on their own earnings record. Absolutely. Okay. okay. I do get that. I've had that question a couple of times, so I'm glad. Yes. And they would just go about the same process of going to the office, making sure that they are appointed as that person's, and then they can apply. Oh, no, they have to be found disabled first. You come in and you have your 40-year-old brother, and he's worked and he needs to apply. You make contact with your local office or you file online. Then he has to go through that whole disability evaluation process you and I just talked about. Mm -hmm. When and if he's found disabled and eligible for monetary benefits, you say, look, he can't handle his money. Let me na be named his rep payee. Mm -hmm. That's the last thing Sounds you like do. like the last step. Right. The last step in this convoluted process. Okay. And when you talk about the evaluation, what does that look like? Like to determine if someone is disabled, what is that evaluation process? Well, the first two steps are quite honestly, uh, well, we won't go there. They look at their age, their education, the kind of work you did in the past, your medically diagnosed impairments, and how they affect your ability to work. Uh, and and it's it's a process that differs depending how old you are, the functional limitations you suffer the medical treatment you get, 
So when you ask, do you need an attorney? And again, I'm not saying, but when you look at the, yes, people typically need help, particularly someone who's not well-educated, who doesn't have access to ordering medical records, who doesn't understand how to file an appeal, how to complete this paperwork, Social Security keeps sending them and sending them and sending them. Yes, I would recommend you get anyone, your mother, your brother, your cousin who's an attorney, get somebody to help you. Okay, okay. And persevere through this. Absolutely. It sounds like um, this is something that's just as complicated sometimes as uh, veterans benefits. And I was going to use that analogy. Veterans benefits, I think, are more difficult to obtain, but this is close to it. Just yeah. as in, like, frustrating, takes a long time. Right. Um, so usually whenever... Would you recommend somebody go physically to a social security office or like call not taking, customer service? Call because for the most part, they're not taking in person appointments. Okay. Call. Call. And in. if you don't know what office to call, there's a website called Social Security Office Locator. Go there, put in your zip code, and it will give you the phone number and the address of your local office. Okay. Okay. Um, Another question, how um, how should people reach out to a social security attorney? I know I have a list of some um, different uh, social security attorneys locally. Is there like a um, social security attorney network out there that people would- Yes, it is. Talking? It's called, if you, if you want a referral, and um, it's called NOSCAR, the National Association of Social Security Claims Representatives. You can contact them, tell them where you live, and they'll give you a list of, of uh, recognized attorneys who, who do this, have done this, and how to get in touch with them. Okay, uh, that's helpful. Yes, NOSCAR. Okay, but what are the letters of that? And I'll, and I'll message everybody in the chat. N-O-S-S-C-R. Okay, got it. Um, and Miss Barbara, let's say we have a family on the um, on the Zoom here that has more questions specifically for you. How would you recommend somebody getting in contact with you? Well, you can call me. It's 888-561-2561. You can email me at B, as in boy, Mixon. M I X O N at N B A law firm dot com. Okay. And I or you can your... talk, you can and additionally you can go on our website, Neville Beard and Arsenal website, and we have uh, a screen there where you can fill out information and someone will call you back immediately. So you can visit our website, you can email me directly, or you can call me. Okay. And I can put your um, follow up information within our um, within an email that I can send everybody just with your contact Thank information. You. Um, are there any other frequently asked questions that you typically get, or any like words of wisdom that you would talk to a caregiver um, about this process or about um, the financial aspects of caregiving? Anything like that that you wanted to share with us? Well, first of all, if I would talk to a caregiver, I would give them my uh, greatest tribute, as I said, I just went through this with my mother. Two of my mother's sisters had Alzheimer's. It's going to make me cry. It's a devastating disease. And anyone who takes care of someone, you have my utmost admiration. And whatever benefits are out there, God help you, because I could never do it. It's devastating. What I would tell you to do, what, what if I got carried away? What did you ask me? What would I tell a caregiver? I would tell a caregiver if you're the person you're caring for has any financial resources, meet with an estate planner. Please meet with an estate planner. You've got to get them eventually. If they're going to be placed in any kind of nursing home, you've got to get a Medicaid qualified. And you can't just do that the day before you know that. You can't do it the day before you put them in a nursing home. Now, assisted living, Medicaid doesn't pay for that. And look, my in-laws went through over a million dollars in assisted living. And it's it's just you give me advice on that. People are living longer. It's un, I don't know how people bear the expense of this. 
I would look out for every agency that can help you. Uh, I don't know how people do it. I really don't financially and emotionally. So y'all have all my respect, but please talk to an estate planner if you're talking to some about someone with any kind. Get long-term disability care benefits if you can. Mm -hmm. Do whatever you can to prepare yourself for that ultimate moment we're all going to face. And and uh, that, that's all I can tell you. If you think the person's disabled, go ahead and file. File for any kind of benefits you can imagine. If you're denied, keep going through it, okay? Don't give up. That's what I can tell you. Don't give up on any of this. I'm so. sure that's a sentence that you say quite often to people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Then yeah. don't give up on this. Yeah. Y'all are doing God's work. I know that. Well, and I know um it, it can, I'm sure a lot of, you know, the don't get up give up um the frequent denials and things like that, it can become very disheartening. And I think a lot of our caregivers that we speak with that are, you know, dementia caregivers, a lot of that caregiving journey is very disheartening, um, which is the whole reason why our organization exists and why a lot of different organizations locally exist um, and nationally um, is to support caregivers through this journey. So um, I'm going to use that as a segue to talk about um, one of our past presentations that we just did um, as a part of Making Sense of Sense, which was um, last week we did a It Takes a Village presentation um, that was myself that did that. Um, it's on our YouTube channel already. Miss Barbara, I'll send it to you just so that you Thanks can reference you. it. Thank you. Um, if anybody has any questions about local community resources that can help financially, emotionally, medically, um, you name it, I, I tried to um, address everything within that presentation. And then next week, um, also to segue off of what Ms. Barbara just uh, spoke about, um, we have a presentation by certified financial planner, Adam Kerrigan. He um, is going to talk about um, all of the things to consider when caring for and planning for long-term care um, for a loved one. And that is gonna be a presentation for, of course, dementia caregivers, but really anybody, um, because we all are responsible for our own choices for our future. And then if we are in the caregiving process for anybody, it just helps to get our ducks in a row. Um, it seems like that has been kind of a theme of this presentation today is um, you have to kind of do the work initially to be able to receive the benefit later on. So that's also one of the main goals of this educational program is to instill you with that knowledge to um, you know help you get your ducks in a row so that you can um, receive as many of those benefits as you can. Um, and I will tell you to be proactive in this. Yes, it definitely helps. Yes. And be as proactive as early as possible so that you have the options available to you as possible. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then um, just before we close, I did want to say that um, thank you to everybody that joined us today um, and who is joining us in our Making Sense of Sense presentation. I'll send a follow-up email just with all of those things that we referred to today. And then also Miss Barbara's contact information in case you had any specific questions for her. Um, I hope we see you again um, next week for our uh, last Making Sense of Sense presentation. And then if you wanted to join us tomorrow for our ADAPT series presentation, on adaptive diet and delaying dementia through your diet. Um, make sure to register for that so I can send you the Zoom link. But um, Miss Barbara, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us today. I'm glad that we recorded this presentation so that I can rewatch some of it um, just to get it in my, in my noggin. But um, thank you for sharing your expertise with us today and, um, and taking some time with us. Well, I appreciate you giving me the opportunity. Yes, ma'am. Yes, uh, ma'am. Alrighty. Thank you so much. Well, I'm going to go ahead and end, end the, um, the Zoom. Thank you so much for uh, your time today. Oh, all right. Goodbye. All right. Thank you.